Welcome to Father Matt's Bible Studies and Sermons Podcast. My name is Matthew Mead. I'm the priest and rector at the Parish of Christ the Redeemer in Pelham, New York. In today's Bible study, we begin our study of the first, second, and third letters of St. John. This follows our study of the Gospel according to John. Uh, God bless. Hope you enjoy the Bible study, and have a great day. All right, let us pray. Mighty God, we ask your blessing on our Bible study as we approach the Thanksgiving holiday next week, when we will not have a Bible study because it is a Thursday. Uh, we ask that you fill our hearts and our minds and our souls with your Holy Spirit as we read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest the letters and uh, epistles of St. John. All this we ask through Christ our Lord. Okay, a um, couple of things. One, um, we... Oh, did anybody notice the collect on Sunday morning that we used for the 10 a.m. and the 8 a.m.? It's that prayer that talks about read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest the scriptures. Um, it's the Sunday before the last Sunday. It's the second to last Sunday of Pentecost every year is that collect. So today we are going, we finished St. John's Gospel last week, and today we're going to begin looking at the epistles of St. John. Um, there are three of them, and my goal today is not to finish all of them, but my goal is to actually at least attempt to read the entire first one, not so that we're finished with it, because it's five chapters long, but so that you can kind of look at the whole thing in one fell swoop, because I suspect that most of us have not read any of these epistles in a while or perhaps ever, and uh, it can be helpful to read the whole thing, and these are short enough that you can do that, and then go back and kind of dig into it. So a couple of minor things. I'll start by sharing uh, my screen, if you can see it. Can you see my screen with this map? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, JD, I believe, has been there. But so uh, JD has definitely been here. But Jerusalem is down here. I think all of you have been there, or most of you. But Jerusalem is down here. The church spreads out you know, in different directions in the, the first, second generation after Jesus. The various apostles go in different places. Paul kind of goes all over the place, you know, various missionary journeys. He eventually ends up in Rome over here on the left. Um, traditionally, the um, um, epistle and uh, the epistles of John and gospel of John uh, are traditionally written in um, Ephesus, which is over here. And uh, that's where the traditional burial is of St. John uh, the Evangelist, uh, a.k.a. the Beloved Disciple. Um, I'm not seeing on my map Patmos, um, and it's an island somewhere in here. Um, but uh, uh, Patmos is the traditional... It is, is uh, um, not the tradition. Patmos is where the book of Revelation is written by John. And whether or not that's the same John is kind of an open question. The odds are not good. Uh, we read Revelation before we read the gospel according to St. John. There are some common vocabularies like the lamb and things like that. Uh, but thematically, it's very different and the style is very different. And Ephesus and Patmos are not the same place. Um, and so probably they're two different people for what it's worth. St. John the Evangelist and uh, St. John the Divine is usually what, uh, as in our cathedral, is usually what um, the author of Revelation is referred to because he's sort of a future-looking prophet. Um, so the guy we're talking about is probably, and the community that we've been reading about is probably in Ephesus. Um, there's no re real reason not to doubt that. <laughs> And um, uh, he, the gospel and the letters never actually say, I'm John and I'm writing this. Uh, in fact, throughout the gospel, you probably noticed that um, the, you know, the author never referred to himself as anything other than, um, you know, sort of I and occasionally it seems like the beloved disciple. And then there was this whole we business 
And I'm going to stop sharing for one second so I can show you that before we go anywhere else. So you may recall we finished the gospel last time with this um, right here. Where did you all go? There you are. Okay. Uh, this is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them, and we know that his testimony is true. But there are also many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. The epistles seem to pick up almost exactly where this leaves off. And the a good way to think about the first epistle, so there are three of them. The first one is five chapters. The second one is one chapter. And the third one is one chapter. And uh, the way the New Testament generally is organized is that the collections, plural, of letters are organized um, by author, and whoever has the biggest collection tends to go first, Paul, and each longest letter is the longest, and then it goes down. If a letter has a companion letter, um, that's after the first one. So uh, uh, Romans is, I believe, the longest, and then 1 Corinthians is the second longest, and then 2 Corinthians, and uh, and and on and on down from there, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, uh, and what have you. And then after Paul is done, then you get to the other writers. And so in John's case, 1st John, 2nd John, and 3rd John are organized not necessarily by when they were written, but by which is the shortest uh, is the last one, and which is the longest is the first one. And that um, actually can be kind of confusing because there's a decent argument to make that um, that uh, you don't really know which was written in what order for what that's worth. Um, the other thing is way back when, when we read the letter to the Hebrews, I don't know how many of you recall that or even were in the Bible study back then, but we talked about the style of letters and um, how most letters in the New Testament follow a standard letter format. I'm Paul, I'm Peter, I'm writing to you wherever you are. Uh, I may be here um, and I'm writing to you in Corinth or I'm writing to you in wherever. Um, and then at the end, it says things like, you know, uh, say hello to, 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 to Mary and Bill and Bob, uh, tell Luke to bring my books. If you remember all that, right, uh, tell Mark uh, to get over here. I miss him. And it's encapsulated in a letter. The first letter of John is not like that at all. It's more like if you had an alternate version of chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 in John, or maybe 14, 15, 16, and 17. Remember that long discourse that we had after the Last Supper where Jesus kept talking about abiding and loving and you'll be with me and the truth and the advocate and all this other, uh, that kind of stuff. The first letter of John sounds like a sermon with that exact same material. The second letter of John is uh, much shorter, and it is uh, thematically very similar to the first letter, uh, but it's much, 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 much shorter. The third letter of John is written to some guy named Gaius and uh, deals with a very specific um, circumstance in his in a community that we don't exactly know where it is, uh, but contains a lot of the exact same themes and uh, concepts that the first two letters and that giant passage from uh, 14 to 17 in the Gospel of John. The other thing that's worth noting as we go through is that the, um, the, uh, the title or topic of uh, Christ is all over the New Testament, right? Jesus, his title is Christ. It is a Greek word that is that means the anointed one. It is the Greek translation of Messiah, which is the Hebrew word, which means anointed one. And uh, we see that everywhere in the New Testament. And that is who Jesus is. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ. There is another title that only pops up in um, the first and second letters of John, and that is Antichrist. And it may surprise you that the Antichrist 
doesn't actually pop up as a name or a title in the book of Revelation because it would seem like it would, but it okay. doesn't. It only pops up in these two letters, the first two of the three, and an antichrist in John's context seems to be somebody that is a false teacher, former official Christian, former part of the community who has strayed off in terms of what he or she is teaching. And it seems most of the time that the Antichrists are people that talk about Jesus came only in the spirit and not in the flesh, mm -hmm. which is a heresy, actually, that uh, that gets <clears throat> big time later, um, you know, generations later. And um, the which I think is uh, well, it's a, a mix of a couple different heresies. But um, the other thing is it seems that the Antichrists also sometimes talk about that Jesus is not God. So essentially the antichrists are people that are discounting Jesus's humanity and divinity, which is very different than what we think of as an antichrist. Um, that term has taken on its own, um, its own kind of trajectory and has really kind of um, attached itself to a lot of the language and themes and imagery of the book of Revelation and uh, Second and First Thessalonians, which we haven't read, but perhaps we will at some point, um, where it talks about Paul talks about the man of lawlessness and all this other stuff. Uh, but in these letters, an antichrist is somebody who probably used to be a leader in the church and is now essentially uh, leading uh, people astray with heretical um, teachings about Jesus specifically. So what we're going to do, I think we have enough time to pull this off. We are going to fly through the intro to the letter of John, the first one, um, and then we're going to fly through the actual letter. And what I want you to listen to as we fly through it is how much language sounds like it was exactly taken from St. John's Gospel and how much language in it is different. And thirdly, how many things in the letter, and we can stop along the way briefly, but how many things in the letter you actually thought were in St. John's Gospel, even though they weren't. So you know this letter because it's read in church pretty regularly and it's preached on. Um, the phrase, God is love, right? You've heard that a million times. That comes from this letter. Everybody seems to think it comes from the Gospel according to St. John, but it actually comes from the first John. Okay. Um, all right. Can you see my screen? I think you can. Okay. I'm going to start and then we're just going to go to a quick clip to try to cruise through this. And again, the goal is when we meet again in two weeks is to basically chop this letter in half and look at it again, but more slowly so that we can cover it. And my hope and plan is that, um, in the handful of Thursdays we have in December, that we can finish this letter and, and second John and third John, which sets us up in January to do something brand new. Okay. All right. Uh, I will start and um, we'll go from there. The uh, name and canonical context. And this, this is an introduction written by a professor. Uh, I think she's a Lutheran named Alicia Myers. And this is in the SBL study Bible, which is a very reputable uh, new revised standard version, updated edition Bible. The first letter of John begins a collection of three letters attributed to the person called John. Together, the three letters are often dubbed the Johannine letters. First John appears first in the triad because it is the longest rather than necessarily being the first written. The letters are located among the other general letters, James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and Jude. And as I mentioned, um, First Peter is longer than Second Peter. That's how those are organized. It has nothing to do with which was written first or, or not. It's just the length. Um, but they, the general letters, uh, sorry, the letters of John, but they also share a relationship to the Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation, both of which, at least traditionally, were authored by someone named John. Revelation's unique genre encourages most readers to consider it separately, as does the fact that the John described in Revelation 1.1 is probably not the same as the authors 
the plural there, of the Gospel and Letters of John. The Gospel and Letters of John, however, share distinct vocabulary, identical phrases, and similar religious outlooks. Especially, and I mentioned this a second ago, especially John 13 to 17, which is that Last Supper discourse and the Last Supper itself, and First John, the entire letter. And you'll see that. It's like, I feel like I've read this before. Um, although the Gospel of John should not be assumed to fit precisely with First, Second, and Third John, reading all four writings together gives a greater sense of their commonalities as well as their distinguishing features. Uh, I'm going to keep going because I've read this and I can read it, I think, fairly quickly and comment as I go. Authorship and date. All the Johannine writings are traditionally attributed to the apostle John, the son of Zebedee, named in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew 4, 21, Mark 1, 19, and Luke 5, 10. Tradition identifies John as the, quote, beloved disciple, quote, who reclined on Jesus's chest as the primary witness to the gospel of John's story. And that as we've seen very recently, John 13 at the Last Supper, John 19 at the cross, uh, John 20 uh, at the tomb, and John 21 walking behind Peter and um, also on the seashore. The connection of this apostle to these writings increased their canonical status. Today, most scholars, I'm not sure I entirely agree with this, most many scholars doubt that the apostle John wrote these works although he might be the authority figure for their traditions. Uh, see the introduction of the Gospel of John. We talked a little bit about that, that I-we thing. The John, uh, you know, the Apostle John is probably the eyewitness upon whose uh, authority and, and, and testimony the Gospel and the letters are written. And that's less obvious in the Gospel because there's this I stuff and it seems to, and we stuff from time to time. Um, it's a little more obvious, I think, in um, the first letter, and again, less obvious when you get to the second and third letters. Um, uh, so it's it's just hard to tell who's 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 writing. But I would suggest the easiest way to think about it is Saint John the Evangelist. Let's assume it's him. Um, is is the same as the son of Zebedee, and he has a community that builds up around him, and. At some point, they, the community, puts together all of his traditions and writings into um, these three letters in the gospel. It's one decent way of thinking about it. First John is anonymous, but its connection to second and third John leads many to suggest the author is the same, quote, elder responsible for those letters. The elder is named in second John 1 and third John 1, and we'll see that. However, second and third John are also technically anonymous, since elder is a title rather than a name. The fact that John was a common name in the Roman world and the New Testament makes identification difficult. Even the second century Bishop Papias conflated the Apostle John and an Elder John, both of whom were connected to Ephesus. Matt, what does conflated mean? Um, so what this says is this is this is second century. You're talking like 100 to 200 for what that's worth, right? So pretty close to this. And Papias is a bishop and um, at the time, I can't remember exactly what years, and he, uh, by conflated, he's um, in his mind or by the time it gets to him, um, there is an elder named John from Ephesus and there is an apostle named John who may or may not be from Ephesus. And in the tradition, they have already become one person by the time Papias gets there. And there is some evidence that they were two people. So conflated is he's He's combining, it'd be like combining uh, 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 Juan Soto and uh, Mike uh, and uh, and Judge, like two enormous home run hitters on the Yankees in a hundred years and being like, oh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's Juan Judge. It's like, no, 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 they were uh, the same. They were two different guys. It's kind of like that. It's combining two different people, which is easy, easy to do in the ancient world when you have an elder named John and an apostle named John in towns and they're all Christians. And they're all connected to Ephesus. Uh, the Johannine letters were probably composed between 90 and 110 uh, AD, CE. CE is the common era, um, maps up with AD. It is unclear if they were written before or after the Gospel of John or finished alongside its completion. Uh, ancient and cultural context. The seaport city of Ephesus, we saw that on the map, is the backdrop of 1 John. Um I don't think it's actually mentioned in, in the letter. So this is a bit of a jump, but that's uh, what this scholar says. 
Known for banking, commerce, and its strategic location at the mouth of the Kaster River on the western coast of Turfie, Turkey, Ephesus was the multicultural mother city of Asia Minor with a population of between 200 and 250,000 inhabitants. Unlike Philippi and Corinth, Ephesus was not a Roman colony, but a free city of the Roman Empire. The city coined its own money and operated its own city council while still paying to Rome. In some, Ephesus was an economically prosperous and rich multicultural and interreligious hub in Asia Minor, um, the ideal context for diverse and contentious relationships between the Christ followers, we tend to call them Christians, uh, addressed in the Johannine letters. Uh, sometimes the academic language in here gets a little annoying. Um, many interpreters suggest 1 John was written to address a conflict between Christ followers about the relationship between Jesus's divinity and humanity. I was talking about that with the um, Antichrist a second ago. The author of 1 John faces opponents who either do not believe Jesus was God in human form or believe he is no longer he he no longer is human and therefore that his death and resurrection are irrelevant these opponents instead emphasize their connection to the spirit while the author emphasizes the unity of Jesus's identity as a human and as God's son and Christ um as a, a an aside the big conflict in the gospel according to John was between Christians and Jews, right? That came up over and over again in the way the gospel is written. That conflict doesn't appear in this letter in the same way at all. The big conflict in this letter is between Christians and people that are teaching the wrong sort of Christianity. First John is closely related to second and third John, which detail a rift in the community over Jesus's coming in the flesh. Uh, 2 John 7, and conflicts over hospitality, 2 John 10 and 3 John uh, 9. In the Roman world, refusing to welcome someone was frequently more than a social snub. In many cases, it was a rejection of the person who had sent the messenger and the message itself. Um, do you remember that line in, it was in that long sermon discourse, Whoever, you know, the Father has sent me and I now send you, whoever accepts you and doesn't accept me, right, doesn't accept me. There's a lot of stuff linked to this that, that all kind of um, plays out in terms of welcome and rejection of a messenger and a message. Whenever the conflicts behind first John, and, uh, second and third John, these writings show that early Christians did not always agree about Jesus's identity or his role in salvation and that such disagreements had practical implications on their daily lives. Any questions up to this point? Okay. Um, for the record, whenever you read like a letter or a Bible book, always read the intro. It's very helpful to give you some background on it. Uh, literary genre and context. Although 1 John is called a letter, it is better understood as a sermon. Unlike letters, 1 John does not have an opening or a closing greeting. It begins with a series of relative clauses that pick up in mid-thought. Um, the idea of the sermon repeat, making this writing one of the most difficult for contemporary readers to outline. Rather than being written sloppily, 1 John is intentional about its repetition, using it for amplification and emphasis to challenge and encourage its audience. I would actually go so far as to say it's very well written, and it's, um, it's very readable from start to finish, which is why we're going to do that in a second. The sermon opens with a prologue that verifies the author's authority an intent to remain in fellowship with the audience, um, which compares, and this is worth noting, the when we're reading the intro, think of the intro to the gospel. In the beginning was the word, all that. Think about that as we're reading the intro. First John then explains how Jesus is the solution to the problem of sin and encourages its audience to continue loving one another in imitation of Jesus's love. Um, for the author of First John, behavior re reveals people's true identities either as antichrists or as children of God. And that echoes the children of the light and the darkness. Remember, we saw that in John, people that were in darkness versus people in light. The sermon ends with an exaltation of God's love and a final command for believers to love as God loves, as revealed by means of Jesus, God's Son in Christ. Distinctive features, 1 John is known for its emphasis on love and contains the famous line, God is love, 4.8 and 4.16. This makes its anti-Christ language difficult, in part because of how later Christians' circles 
interpreted Antichrist language and imagery. The term Antichrist appears only in 1st and 2nd John in the entire New Testament. It refers to anyone who was once a believer, but now opposes the confession that Jesus is God's Son and Christ. In contrast to God's perfect love, 1st John argues that the Antichrists, plural, disconnected themselves from Jesus' example and turned to love the world and themselves instead. Overall, however, 1 John's focus is on love. The sermon calls on its audience to abide in fellowship with the author and with God. Empowered by the spirit of truth, Christ's followers are to continue confessing and loving one another. For 1 John, a distinct attribute of the children of God is fellowship and present participation in eternal life through Jesus. All right, any questions on that? Comments? Okay. Um, Again, as we read, we're just going to fly through this. Uh, we've got five of us, and so we'll probably just take a chapter each and do like that, okay? The literary structure, prologue and call to maintain fellowship is the little beginning. Um, the bulk of the second, the first chapter, Jesus is the solution to the problem of sin. Chapter two, commands to love one another and not possessions. Chapter, The rest of chapter two, schism between those who left and those who remain. Uh, chapters three and the first half of four, behavior reveals identity, and uh, four to the end, God is love. So love one another. And then uh, the last little bit is love and belief. Um, James, can you read, let's see, the first chapter? Right. Okay. The word of life. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you so that you may, you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Oh. Keep going. Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. God is light. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not and do what it, and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So if we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Great. Okay. We will look in depth at this in two weeks, but I hope you heard the beginning word, life, testify, darkness, light, right? A lot of the same language. It sounds like we just picked this up from the father, right? It, it sounds like the gospel ends and it just came right out of it. Um, JD, can you read chapter two? Christ, our advocate, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, by this we know that we have come to know him if we obey his commandments. Whoever says, I have come to know him, but does not obey his commandments is a liar. And in such a person, the truth does not exist. But whoever obeys his word, truly in this person, the love of God has reached perfection. By this we know that we are in him, whoever says, I abide in him, ought to walk in the same way as he walked. A new commandment. Beloved, 
I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new commandment that is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says, I am in the light, while hating a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Whoever loves a brother or sister abides in the light, and in such a person, there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates a brother or sister is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, and does not know the way to go, because the darkness has brought on blindness. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young people, because you have conquered the evil one. I am writing to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young people, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not leave the world or the things in the world. The love of the Father is not in those who love the world. For all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the pride and riches, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desire are passing away, but those who do the will of God abide forever. Warning against Antichrists. Children, it is the last hour. As you have heard that, ant as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many antichrists have come. From this we know that it, is, that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained. They would have remained with us. But by going out, they made it plain that none of them belongs to us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and all of you have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and you know that no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Father, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Everyone who confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you have heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he has promised us, eternal life. I write these things to you concerning those who would deceive you. As for you, the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. So you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he is revealed, we may have confidence and not be put to shame before him at his coming. Children of God, if you perceive that he is righteous, you also know that everyone who does right has been born to him. Great. Okay. So quickly, a couple of things. That's where the Antichrist popped up. L similar language. One thing I do want to say, or rather two, who's the advocate in the gospel according to John? It's the spirit, remember? In the letter, it's Jesus Christ is the advocate. We'll talk about why that might be, but it probably has to do with this whole Antichrist thing where they're talking about it really only the spirit matters. It could be a corrective to how people have misinterpreted the gospel and saying, no, 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 Jesus is the one that really matters here too. The other thing, if you under, ever wondered where the atonement comes from, this is one of the uh, one of the places where the theology of atonement comes from. It's pretty uh, straightforward here. Um, okay, uh, Charlotte, can you read three, chapter three? Okay, <clears throat> see what love, <clears throat> see what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us 
is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What will we be? What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, but we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Everyone who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born of God do not sin because God's seed abides in them. They cannot sin because they have been born of God. The children of God and the children of the devil are revealed in this way. All who do not do what is right are not from God, nor are those who do not love a brother or sister. Love one another. But this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We must not be like Cain, who was from the evil one, who was from the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be astonished, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brothers and sisters. Whoever does not love abides in death. All who hate a brother or sister are murderers. And you know that murderers do not have eternal life abiding in them. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in deed and truth. And by this, we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit that he has given us. Great. Okay, so a couple of quick things. Um, JD had read earlier, uh, I don't give you a new commandment. I give you an old commandment, right? And it was the commandment to love one another as I have loved you. And um that's another probable indication this is written after the gospel, right? They already know that the new commandment. Jesus gave them the new commandment. Now it's an old commandment because it's in them. This matches up really closely. Uh, you may remember this. You may not remember it. I think it's in chapter 14 of St. John's gospel. There's what I refer to as the definition of eternal life. Now eternal life is this, that you believe in the Lord Jesus and keep his commandments. That's almost exactly this, right? Um, that the, the his commandment that we believe in the name of the Son, Jesus, and love one another, just as he commanded us. So it's a lot of the same language. Uh, Patrice, can you read chapter four? Testing the spirits. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you know the spirit of God, Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming. And now it is already in the world. Little children, you are from God and have conquered them. For the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, what they say is from the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us, and whoever is not from God does not listen to us. From this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. 
God is love. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the father has sent his son as the savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the son of God and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and those who abide in love abide in God and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate a brother or sister are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Great. Okay. All Again, all sorts of stuff that we have already heard um, in John's gospel. There's a nearly, you know, God is love is revealed among us. It sounds like John 3, 16 and the prologue together. God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. God so loved the world, right? Uh, uh uh, God loved the, us so much that he also, uh, that we also ought to love one another. It's, um, it, it, it's just coming right out of John. It also has lines that, uh, um, at least for me, I always feel like are actually in the gospel. According to John, God is love again. Perfect love casts out fear. Uh, there's no fear in love. Uh, fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. Uh, we love because he loved uh, first loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate a brother or sister are liars for that you cannot love a sister or brother you've seen. Um, all very familiar stuff, I think. Uh, James, can you finish us off with chapter five? Yes. Everyone who believes that G oh, faith conquers the world. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it? who conquers the world, but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, testimony concerning the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with wa the water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. There are three that testify, the Spirit, and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his son. Those who believe in the son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. 
whoever does not have the son does not have life. Epilogue. Epilogue. Right. I'm writing these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the boldness we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have obtain the requests made of him. If you see your brother or sister committing what is not a deadly sin, you will ask and God's will give life to such a one, to those whose sin is not deadly. There is sin that is deadly. I do not say that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that is not deadly. We know that those who are born of God do not sin, but the one who was born of God protects them, and the evil one does not touch them. We know that we are God's children, and that the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. All right. That's the whole letter. Um, and we did it in 46 minutes. Not too bad. Uh, so a couple of things. Um, that's not unimportant. There are not all that many places in the New Testament where Jesus is overtly identified as God. Um, not as many as you would think, at least. Um, second, um, if you ever wondered where the phrase deadly sins comes from, um, this is one of the places, right? Deadly sins are here, uh, mm -hmm. as was the atonement. Um, there is... Uh, again, this chapter is full of language that we already know. Um, we will talk in depth when we get back to chapter five in a couple of weeks. This is one of the most important uh, textual things in the entire Bible. Uh, this right here, verse seven, where the P is. There's a um, a whole verse or that, that it goes, the reason this verse looks so short is because there's a whole bunch of other stuff after it that is probably not original that um is called the johannine comma not comma as in the uh comma in uh, whatever it's called um but uh not the punctuation comma but uh, comma in a different way and uh the johannine comma is the most overt trinitarian thing in the entire new testament and it's probably not original uh, but we'll talk more about that later. Anyway, any thoughts on this just in general? We will come back to it. I just think my personal view is that it reads well from start to finish, uh, especially after finishing John. Um, things like, I didn't mention this, but blood in the water, right? Blood and water came from the, the his side at the cross. There's a whole bunch of stuff that um, I think can help you understand the gospel, though it's important to know that they are separate things. So, um, but any thoughts on it? Nothing. All right. Uh, we will, in two weeks, we will reconvene and we will read this. My guess is it's going to take us, if you notice, JD's chapter went on forever. So my guess is that we'll probably read chapters one and two, and then the following week, three, four, and five in some depth, go through it all. And then the last week, because I think we only have three Bible studies before Christmas. Um, the last week we will read the two other letters, which are very, very, very short and follow up on this. And um, uh, yeah, so I hope that was helpful. It's sometimes nice to do an entire letter um, in uh, in one thing, but there's, there's a ton in there that we didn't uh, really dig into. Okay, so we'll revisit it in two weeks. All right, God bless everybody. Good to see you. JD, I'm going to give you a call in two minutes. I'll talk to you later. Okay, bye. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you for listening to Father Matt's Bible Studies and Sermons podcast. If you want to learn more, you can visit our website at ChristChurchPelham.org. ChristChurchPelham.org. God bless and have a great day. Thank you.